I'm Mark Benicevic. Welcome to Governance Bites. Today, it's my absolute privilege to interview Coral Engley. Thank you very much for your time, Coral. Thank you, Mark. And it's a great honour for me to be able to talk with you uh, in this session. Thank you. Uh, Coral is, was actually the first New Zealander to get a PhD in governance, or the first person in New Zealand with a PhD in governance, and has supervised postgraduate studies for two of our former interviewees, uh, Dennis Mowbray for his PhD, and Kevin, uh, Kevin McCaffrey for his master's. Uh, so with a long career in governance uh, as an academic at AUT mainly, uh, now does some teaching. She's on the board of Governance New Zealand, uh, on the board of the international body, the Chartered Governance Institute, which is largely a group of Commonwealth countries. So a huge wealth of experience in governance and uh, the challenge will be keeping our conversations short enough to publish. So thank you very much for your time, Coral. <laughs> You're very welcome, Mark. It's a pleasure. So the subject that we want to talk about in our session today is ESG, or environmental, social and governance, the trend towards this space. There's a massive international trend towards environmental, social and governance uh, concepts in business. Um, what is this about, Coral? Well, in simple terms, ESG is the consideration of extra financial information um, that is intended to enable better decision making. Um, that should lead to sustainable growth. But specifically, what we're talking about is a framework that helps stakeholders understand how an organisation uh, is managing its risks um, and opportunities, of course, related to uh, the environment, the social and the um, governance um, of their organisation. Um, and th it includes a number of criteria or what are often called um, ESG factors uh, that are the basis for this framework. Um, it, it takes an, an holistic view, uh, so it's broader than just the environment. Um, it looks at sustainability in a, in a broader holistic sense. Right, okay. And I understand that although this uh, concept of ESG has kind of reared its head publicly over only really over the last few years, it has been around for a lot longer and I think the research has shown that uh, ethical uh, companies or companies that essentially would, would have progressed to follow these factors as they came out uh, have tended to perform better financially mm -hmm. than other companies as well. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. actually turned out to be a, a win for both you know, the, the environment, the uh, society around it, and also for shareholders, hasn't it? Mm. Yes, um, the research coming out is showing that ESG companies outperform uh, non-ESG companies. Um, it is mixed. Um, it's mixed globally across regions. Some regions perform better than others. Some industry sectors perform better than others mm -hmm. in the research, academic and industry research that's being done. Um, I'm thinking Reuters put out a report um, last year which uh, showed specifically what regions were performing and on which indicators. Um, and interestingly, governance factors came out very strongly, whereas the evidence for the social and um, environmental were less um, less clear. Um, I think uh, Morningstar puts out fairly regular um, reports on the research that's been done, um, usually industry based, um, and they've had at least one, if not several, reports um, on how ESG is performing um, this year. Um, Others like the PRI, the, um, they put out, yeah, and there are various um, groups that put out reports on ESG performance over the long term, and uh, we're certainly seeing uh, that ESG companies are outperforming uh, on those indicators. Right, so what is the driving force behind this move towards ESG? Yeah, um, ESG has evolved from other historical um, movements that have focused on things like health and safety, pollution reduction, um, corporate philanthropy and so on. And uh, so we, you know, examples would be um, corporate social responsibility movements and so on. And, uh, and of course, um, the early framework to uh, try and formalise this um, 
was the Global Reporting Initiative, and uh, ESG is part of that. It's evolved out of that um, need to an analyse and come up with um, metrics um, and robust measurements of um, the three factors in the case of ESG particularly, but it's much broader in its scope than, mm. than just uh, looking at the environment. Yes, yes. Which, uh, we've got the climate-related disclosures, uh, changes that are happening in New Zealand, starting with large companies, and then I think with a view to extend them down to smaller companies as time goes on. So uh, there is broadly this trend, uh, th more of an awareness, I think, isn't there, of corporate responsibility, and, and the climate impacts are one aspect of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the societal impacts, the, the broader stakeholder considerations, there's a recent change to the Companies Act where the duty to act in the best interest of the country, company uh, now allows consideration of other stakeholders and things as well, right? So yes. it, it's, it's kind of a whole confluence of things coming together and, and being given this framework of ESG. Yes, I it? think it, it, it is. Certainly um, confluence is a good word. Uh, but I think there's increasing awareness among stakeholders and um, various other factors have sort of um, driven this. Uh, things like obviously the environmental issues and concerns about climate change and degradation of the environment and so on. Um, but it's around good stewardship of resources, scarce resources uh, on the part of companies and uh, balancing stakeholders' concerns. You know, we've had um, collapses in major companies, the global financial crisis uh, I think has been quite a trigger for a lot of attention now being paid to these factors. Um, we've had um, increasing uh, concerns about what companies are doing and the need for transparency or the calls for transparent, greater transparency. Um, and I think that these are key factors, there's other things too, that are driving the need for companies to um, build trust with stakeholders and to um, protect their reputations. Uh, and uh, this is um, certainly, as far as companies are concerned, a major motivator. But you're quite right, regulators are mandating increasingly uh, the requirements to report um, on these uh, issues and, and especially the risks um, that are associated, we're growing out of these concer concerns. Right, as uh, you know, when I speak to directors of, of companies and particularly small businesses, one of the things that I'll often say to them is that when business is going well, companies don't tend to fail. It's when they get blindsided by a risk they didn't see coming that things go wrong. Indeed, yes. And your, your allusion back to the, the uh, global financial crisis is a really uh, key point and as you say having people become more aware of these things and I think then the, the move towards ESG will, will make companies a lot more resilient won't it? Definitely I mean we're, we're in an environment where things are changing really fast you know we've got a lot of challenges emerging uh, for companies uh, in managing uh, the emerging risks that are uh, associated with these challenges and issues and um, I think that uh, to be able to look more deeply at how they're managing those, and I mean the global financial crisis required a much greater focus on risk management and having good systems in place to, to, to do that. But um, ESG is um, often associated with the investment sector Yes. Um, and uh, it's, it is being driven by investors. Um, we've seen the growth in um, mutual funds and other major pension funds uh, as institutional investors um, grow in their influence in this space. And um, they certainly are demanding a lot more um, information coming out of the analytics that ESG frameworks provide in order to um, make good investment decisions and allocate their capital among their portfolios. But of course it's not just, as we've already said, about um, investment institutional investors, it's about uh, the wider stakeholder groups as well. And um, today we have 
a uh, lot more information, more widely available mm-hmm. um, across the, the, the population, really. Um, people are much more aware, generally, of what companies are doing and uh, wanting to know what they're doing. There could be some great data coming forward for some academic research over the next <laughs> couple of decades. Uh, <laughs> the academics are certainly very active in this space, wanting to n- naturally, you know... Um, uh, ascertain the performance of ESG uh, yes. investments and uh, looking at what factors uh, drive that performance and so on. So what impact does this ESG trend have on a board of directors? Well, it has a significant impact really because um, the um, key, key role of investors, a uh, uh, board, sorry, is uh, that of stewardship and um, meeting its obligations as um, in their oversight role, um, particularly of what companies are doing. And uh, also they're under increasing pressure to manage the growing range of uh, risks that result from rapidly um, evolving ESG issues. So um, it's really um, very important for boards to be able to um, manage those and, and also balance their stakeholders' interests um, in, in, and foster business resilience, which is what you've already touched on, as part of their performance um, um, requirement in, t- in terms of their duties. So the increasing volume and complexity of these challenges is causing uh, a greater number of issues to land on the corporate board agendas, Uh, things like geopolitical factors that are growing concern. We've had Ukraine and uh, now Gaza with its potential implications uh, for operating in various markets. Um, Climate change and decarbonisation are particular issues for many companies. So those factors are certainly of much um, greater uh, concern to boards. Um, And of course the regulatory imperative that's growing, we've already mentioned, is becoming increasingly um, these issues um, and that reporting requirement is becoming increasingly integrated into the business and strategy. Broadening the evaluation of particularly materiality um, is is now a, um, a, a, a major impact as far as stakeholders are concerned, as well as changing environment and market conditions. So um, these these things are important in meeting stakeholder expectations, and I think the question of materiality is now going beyond just. Um, considerations of uh, doing good and being seen to be ethical. This has then got to place a large onus on directors to upskill, to make sure that they're getting uh, education around these changing uh, expectations or this, these increased expectations. Because if you're a director who maybe have, has been doing this for a while uh, and we're used to the ex- pre-ESG expectations or the, all of the all of the trends that you you spoke about just a moment ago, and haven't kept up with these requirements, you could be falling quite significantly behind and placing yourself at quite a lot of risk, couldn't you? Oh, most definitely. I think that this is um, you know seen increasingly as part of the risk um, that uh, boards and companies face if they are not equipped to deal with these uh, emerging issues and challenges. Um, In fact, when it comes to uh, the institutional investors, they are looking very closely at uh, companies and their um, transparency and reporting around uh, sustainability issues. And increasingly, the stance is that if companies are not reporting in some rigorous way on these things, then the assumption is that they're not over the risks. They're not. They're not. Mm, not across them. Across them, and uh, they're allocating their capital, new capital, accordingly. So, um, you know, if that's that's a major risk. Wow. Um, well, 
I think, um, we, as I alluded to before, we could go on for this for quite some time, and I'd love to do so, but people would stop watching. So, <laughs> uh, just to, to wrap up a little bit, what is the best, although it would probably be a tough question for you to ask, because your career in governance has been so long and, and very um, academic, and uh, driving governance in governance organisations, but what's the best piece of governance advice you've received over your career? Well, um Yes, that's a very interesting question. I mean, a lot of advice. Um, <laughs> but I think it's really important as a director uh, to realise that you're there to serve the best interests of the company or the organisation. Um, this is a paramount consideration in deliberations and decisions, especially where there might be dissent uh, or confrontation on board issues. Um, as robust discussions around the board table may very well involve. Yes. Um, and as in all things, I think the second thing is to be true to oneself and uh, stand by your ethical principles, um, acting always with integrity. So I think those basics, you know, will stand right. a director uh, um, in, in good stead. And, and standing by your principles and your ethics doesn't mean being stubborn when there is disagreement within a board, uh, because often those disagreements are around uh, stretching out or understanding the information that's on the table and getting a better understanding of the issues that are involved, and then often your initial point of view may change with that changing information. If it is an ethical issue, then you stick to your guns. Yes, indeed. If it's, if it's an ethical issue... Um you know, you must um, be prepared to stand by your principles. Um, but in terms of robust discussion, yes, most definitely, I think the value uh, that a director can contribute, and, and in fact all of the directors around a board table can con contribute, is that diversity of perspective and the ability to look at things more broadly um, than just going along with what, you know, the, the dominant view seems to be um, um, going for. Mm -hmm. So, yes, um, I think that it is a, a learning opportunity as well. And you mentioned just a little while ago uh, that it, it it's sort of lends itself to um, ongoing education in the governance space, most certainly, I think that uh, continuing professional development is a must. Absolutely, uh, particularly with things changing as so the, rapidly in the environment. And, you know, you need to be informed about what's going on, and to if you don't have the skill set yourself, um, either look at how you can upskill, or um, work out where you can go for reliable expert advice. Well, Professor Ingley, that has been fantastic. Thank you very much for your time. I really, really appreciate it, and I'll look forward to catching up again soon. And thank you very much. I'll see you next episode. Thank you, Mark. It's, it's been great. <laughs>